I V M. Hey everybody, I hope you've been enjoying the Ronnie Screwala podcast. This week we're going to do a something a little different. We're going to be taking the first chapter from his book Dream with Your Eyes Open and we're going to play that for you over here. As you can remember, the podcast is mostly about the book itself and we deep dive into each of these chapters. I thought it'd be interesting for you guys to get an idea of what the chapter is. You can get the audiobook on the IVM podcast app on our website and any of the podcasting apps or if you prefer using the normal audiobook companies it's available both on Storytel and soon on Audible with that here's dream with your eyes open the first chapter from Grant Road to Bridge Candy chapter 1 from Grant Road to Bridge Candy risk isn't about rushing headlong into uncertain situations that's just foolish behavior Risk means pushing the envelope when others want to take the safe route and caring more about potential rewards than possible losses. In the 1970s, Mumbai, Bombay then, was a whirl of motion, noise and color. A million Kirana stores lined the streets. This hasn't changed much, with honking ambassador cars, trolley buses and autos jockeying with cycles for space on the narrow roads. There was music, art, literature. People with big ideas and high hopes for the future. Then, as now, the city was a crucible for a young entrepreneur with a dream. As a boy, I soaked in every aspect of vibrant Mumbai like my life depended on it. Back then, India was much more a manufacturing and agriculture economy, and I paid special attention to the economics of business, how family businesses were on the rise, how money changed hands how businesses appeared one day and disappeared the next how out of five shopkeepers selling exactly the same hardware one succeeded where the others failed my childhood at grand road next to novelty cinema was lower middle class we weren't wealthy but we had what we needed we lived in an apartment situated on the first floor of the five story arsiwala building nearly a century old and in constant need of repair it had one long corridor with three rooms that held my brother parents two aunts and grandparents the apartment sleeping area was indistinguishable from its other rooms i recall begging family members to switch with me so their bedroom could become the de facto living room for a while i lived there until the age of 16 privileged enough to go to a school where most of my classmates came in cars while i waited 45 minutes for the bst bus to arrive instead of undermining my confidence my childhood instilled in me philosophies and ways of thinking that stuck with me later when opportunities kicked into warp speed risk was a word i knew but couldn't define i was keen to observe adults who traded goods on the street every day shouting offers back and forth ideas washed over me like the july monsoons though that didn't mean my eyes weren't also open for the neighborhood's attractive young girls that ecosystem spurred my first entrepreneurial experience all of us local kids from the building got together and hung a drop curtain and with handbills invited audiences for the four play come concerts we put up in the evenings rotating the performances in our various living areas i enjoyed bonding with my friends and their parents were thrilled to have their kids doing something productive everybody in the building paid to watch us the kids were in it how could they not and at the age of 10 i earned my first round of money it wasn't much just enough to hire a cycle to earn me a date with a girl who lived just behind us at balaram street those first shows led to other projects each a little more complex than the last My family's small veranda overlooked the cinema at that time one of the city's top movie halls because no one had television then red carpet premieres were a huge spectacle bollywood advertised its films by gathering everyone for twice a month events and waiting for the stars to come out newspapers did the rest splashing flashy front page photos of the industry's most glamorous personalities amitabh bachchan jitendra rajesh khanna shamila tagore helen newton manoj kumar wahid rehman and a host of others the roads around our apartment were chock a block for every premiere 
at our veranda was the ideal vantage point for anyone who wanted to see the glory of Bollywood. Realizing that there was a market for balcony seats, I sold tickets to people who wanted to gawk and point at their favorite stars and snap pictures that proudly show their family and friends. I was tempted to make more money by offering snacks. My grandparents frowned upon food service, the first setback in my entrepreneurial career as a 10-year-old. Still, they and my parents humored me and were pleased by my ambition, even if they drew the line at 15 strange people on their veranda. Small story, sure, but those are the moments that shape my entrepreneurial spirit. No magic formula, no groundbreaking idea, no inside family track or connections. But my childhood at Grant Road was the time of infinite possibility. It whetted my appetite to break out, dream big dreams, and sometimes watch them unfold on a scale larger than I could then imagine. Without doubt, the greatest moment of my adolescent entrepreneurial life was a rock concert organized in the mid-70s when I was 18. According to our parents, rock and roll was a sign the world was ending. Still, young India's interest in Western music was on the rise. Calcutta was considered a center for the country's music culture at that time, though no shows of any magnitude had been produced. Some friends and I wanted to bring attention to Bombay. We invited four groups from across India to come to the city. It was an ambitious project the first multi-city music fusion show the country had ever seen. We sought out the largest venue and booked it, the 3,000-seat Shanmukananda Hall, huge for its time and, as it turned out, the source of our downfall. We sold 1,500 tickets at rupees 100 each. Half the hall, not a bad crowd, and sponsors helped defray the cost. None of us had organized an event on such a grand scale before. So we went to town with the special effects. As the event neared, costs escalated. But we were an enthusiastic lot. We wanted to put on the best show anyone had ever seen in India. Happily, the show went off without a hitch. The word of mouth reviews were superb. We had put out all the stops, given people what they wanted, rocked and rolled. In all that, we had succeeded. But when the lights came on, we were rupees 50,000 in the hole. Even divided amongst three of us, it was still a massive sum for me at that stage. I was bankrupt. It took me the better part of a year to pay off my share of the losses. I felt the sting of debt and learned what it meant to ask, but not beg. I got a third of my share by going separately to my parents, aunts and grandparents, and a third from two girlfriends. The last third tested my hunger and resilience. The part of me that said, I'll keep going and the next idea will be even bigger and better. Having done some front-of-stage hosting, I felt I could pitch to be a model in an advert. I had heard that models got paid a decent sum for a couple of days' work, so here was my opportunity to pick up a possible 10 grand, wiping out my losses in one swipe. I cold-called most of the city's advertising agencies, but had little success after three weeks and ten meets. Despite the rejections, giving up was not an option. A week later, I walked into the office of Lintas, now Low Lintas, to do the same routine with the model coordinator there. This time, there was a short line of talent auditioning for voiceovers, so I wiggled my way into the audio studio for the test, an advert for a chocolate brand. Once there, I had no clue what to do. The test took all of five minutes and the wait outside afterwards seemed like an eternity. Eventually, a lady I would come to know later as Usha Bandarkar, the agency's creative head, approached me. I assumed she was coming to me with bad news. Instead, she told me I'd got the assignment. The final recording was in a few days. A week later, for delivering one punchline, I was staring at a check with my name on it. A great start to my coming of age at 18. One amongst a few other moments in those early days when I knew and felt, I can do this. As enjoyable as the voiceover work was, my learnings from the failed music show were quick and painful and remain an integral part of my entrepreneurial DNA. A DNA that insists, just be convinced, be confident and go for it and I'll figure out where the money will come from. Financially, the equivalent of skydiving without a parachute. 
When I hit the ground, though, I couldn't have felt better about things. The money would take care of itself. Of that much, I was sure. But for the next few nights, I slept little, wandering the streets of Bombay at all hours, thinking only about what I could do bigger and better, and this time, call my own. My desire was to be my own boss, to set a challenge and achieve it, to stretch an idea pole to pole, east to west, and take it to scale. Risk isn't about going headlong into situations where the outcome can't be predicted. That's just foolish behavior. Risk means pushing the envelope when others want to take the safe route. Risk means caring more about potential rewards than possible losses. To separate yourself from the crowd, think through the worst-case scenarios as possibilities. If a worst-case scenario does become a reality, be just as willing to move on to bigger and better things. In my later work in cable television, media, toothbrushes and more, I recognize my adolescent self, the long-haired kid with too much energy and no fear, bursting with the leap-first, look-later mentality. One of the questions I'm most often asked by would-be entrepreneurs is, when do I take the leap? I've never come up with a better answer than, who knows better than you? You're the only one who can decide, based on your best guess, backed by logic and intuition, your research and the support of people you trust, when is the best time? Maybe a better question would be, how do you visualize your leap? For the most parts, I'm proactive, not reactive. I'd rather jump than be pushed. It's the Rocky or Dilwale Dulhania Le Jayenge moment with the inspirational music and the push-ups, the motivational montage and the run up the steps, the freeze frame ending, arms raised in victory or hand held out for an eternity from a train leaving the station. Now in both scenes, there's a supportive family, the kiss on the cheek, and the whisper in the ear, go for it and win. Then you come back to reality and realize you have one hell of a lot of work in front of you. And you're equal to that task. I have my parents to thank for supporting me during those early days. Their support was never monetary, but they understood that creating something of value could be a noble enterprise. That's an important point to make, since so much of an Indian family's hesitation to consider entrepreneurship as a viable option seems to hinge on finances. I never worried about what happens if I fail. Instead, I focused on what's the worst case situation if I did. When asked why I wouldn't get an MBA or a chartered accountancy degree, I'd reply, the process is just too long and it's not what I want to do. Let's be clear here. I am all for deep studies and more if you plan to be a specialist. That's a personal choice. I think studying accountancy, for instance, is huge. A long journey that teaches you one of the most important lessons we can learn in life. Stay the course. My brother did his MBA and a PhD in human resources. I have always respected his complete clarity of thought and his determined pursuit of goals. Over the years, though, I came to understand and appreciate how my attitude towards entrepreneurship caused my parents massive levels of worry and concern. In most other families, the friction and irritation would have been evident, maybe irreconcilable. But my parents were kind enough not to show it. Rather, they respected the fact that I was reaching for my dream. On my part, I knew that if I ran one of my ideas into the ground, they didn't have the resources to bail me out. I was fortunate to have their steady, mostly unspoken support. But one of the greatest challenges still facing Indian entrepreneurs is buying from family and friends. Even today, when the rest of the world is waking up to the untapped potential of entrepreneurship, the country's ecosystem is such that parents think their children should get jobs, not risk the family's money and reputation on a pipe dream. This might surprise you. I can't say on balance that I disagree with many of the naysayers. Not everyone is cut out to be an entrepreneur, a difficult endeavor under the best of circumstances, one not made any easier by India's culture of deference. Many young adults respect their parents too much to go against their wishes. Still, the millennial generation tends to think their parents don't understand the new culture. 
Just because the previous generation did things one way doesn't mean those methods are effective, relevant, or even possible in today's light-speed world. That mold needs to be broken. Ask anyone for a definition of a first-generation entrepreneur. Chances are you'll get a blank stare or a wrong answer. India has its own built-in risk component, and the country's existential economy doesn't guarantee a ready market for entrepreneurs. So, when Indians launch innovative, disruptive ideas that would rise like rockets in many other countries, in India they need to understand the market inside out and prepare to work hard before seeing a profit. Also, they cannot forget, success is possible, and not all success is measured in millions and billions. I started UTV with 37,500 rupees, good for basic rent and some salaries. The business needed to generate positive cash flow from month three. For the first five years, there was no external funding, no ecosystem in place where I could land without crashing if things didn't go as planned. There was no option in those early days of attracting venture capital or private equity into the media and entertainment business, as no one understood its potential. The business had to pay for itself. Cash flows were always stretched, but we remained positive. The possibility of failure must never faze you. The sun will rise in the morning, whether your idea pans out or not. What I do have a problem with is putting a time limit on going out on your own. It's a journey, not an outing. You can't make a deal with yourself or your family by saying, I'm going to try this out for two years and see. That mindset is a complete recipe for failure. Nor does age have much bearing on the success or failure of most entrepreneurial endeavors. People ask me, What's the right age to begin thinking about entrepreneurship? My initial response is, I don't remember a time when I wasn't thinking about building something of value. Don't worry about age so long as you go into any endeavor with your eyes open, a reasonable plan, your bullshit detector fine-tuned, and your work ethic operating at peak capacity. Conventional wisdom suggests that the older you get, the lower your ability to take risks and, in many cases, the more adamantly your family, spouse or kids will question your career choices. Logically, this might make sense. You've got more fixed overheads, you're likely looking after more people than when you were single. But that's not a big deal, because those negatives are offset by the life experience you've picked up along the way and the shortened learning curve for someone who knows a lot more about how the world works. Bottom line, the right familial situation or age to jump in is when you feel confident, driven, and ready to jump. Most impediments to entrepreneurship are put in place by people who don't have the imagination to dream. Go into every fight certain you're going to win. As General George Patton once said, No bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. He won by making the other dumb bastard die for his. The fact is, after a relatively brief period, you'll know whether or not you're cut out to be an entrepreneur. If you're chugging like a freight train in a positive direction, no one will tell you to stop because your family doesn't approve or you've aged out of the market. You'll have no choice but to keep working to reach your goals. That's why you're an entrepreneur. Jump or get pushed. When learning to swim at the Cricket Club of India, CCI Pool, at the age of eight, I struggled to learn from the coach. One day, out of the blue, my dad picked me up and heaved me into the deep end. No floats, nothing. I went down and came up, down and up again, beat the water. And after a few seconds that felt like forever, I managed to surface and stay there, much to my father's delight. Problem solved. From then on... I swam. Three days of pussyfooting around the pool when all it took was half a minute of intense concentration and maybe a little fear, followed by the realization that nothing bad was going to happen. In retrospect, I remember two things about that day. One, if you're half smart, you'll figure out how to survive. Two, far from being mean or neglectful, my dad, who was fully clothed when he grabbed me and dunked me, exhibited the greatest confidence in my ability. He somehow knew that while I might swallow some water and sputter, 
In the end, I would be fine. I recall a similar incident with my daughter Trisha many years later. Two and a half at that time, she walked straight into the pool on her own with no idea something bad might happen. She disappeared into the water just as I put down the book I was reading on a deck chair. Panicking, I jumped in fully clothed, grabbed Trisha and gently placed her, petrified and shaking at the edge of the pool. An hour later, I took her back to the pool to underplay her bad experience. My concern, of course, was that she would fear water for the rest of her life. Instead, she became an ace swimmer, top of her class and school, a certified scuba diver and more comfortable in water than anyone I've ever seen. Because of a young age, I don't think Trisha completely remembers the trauma. But a lifelong fear of the water or a powerful fear of anything like failure can change your attitude towards a lot of life's experiences. Trisha and I laugh about this incident now. She thinks I overreacted. I tell her that's what parents do. I'm not quite sure if I meant the saving, the overreacting or both. My first big setback, a literal failure, came early in life. When we lived at Grant Road, my schooling was at Dunn's Institute, a place that holds great memories for me. When we moved to Breach Candy, I also moved schools, joining Cathedral School in Class 7. At Dunn's, I got teased a lot about my unique last name. Since it was mainly a boy's school, I wasn't too affected by the leg pulling. But when I moved to Cathedral... I knew I had to convert my last name to my advantage, partly because I wasn't ready to start all over again with the ragging, but mainly because it was a co-ed school. So from the outset, I broke the ice with jokes about my last name, just how Parsis make the corniest jokes about themselves. It worked. The girls thought it was funny and charming, I think. And I had taken the sting out of the joke for the boys. Since I was already making a joke at my own expense... There was not much they could add. I was a good student. In those days, the final exam was not in class 10, but class 11. The latter class was called Senior Cambridge. A good grade in that class allowed one to jump a year ahead in college. As it happened, I did well enough in my last year at Cathedral to move straight into the second year of my Bachelor of Commerce BCom degree at Sydney College. Even back then, I realized that a BCom was a fallback pursuit for me. That was a memorable year, straight out of one of the country's top schools with great marks to being involved with many of the college's high-profile activities. But I was on a crash course for arrogance. I knew it all and spent too much time hanging out at the nearby St. Xavier's College where the smartest girls studied. Then came the wake-up call. The year was over, exams completed, vacation enjoyed. I sauntered back to Sydney to look at the notice board for my results, certain I had secured nothing but the highest marks. Sheer arrogance compelled me to run only through the list of those in first class. When I didn't see my name there, I scanned the roll more carefully. Nothing. My heart pounded in my chest. Surely there's been a mistake, I thought. No mistake, an hour later, I realized I wasn't on any list. I had failed the year. Disbelief led to denial as each and every one of my friends and colleagues found their names on the first class list. Then the reality sank in. My first thought was, my parents have made sacrifices to put me through college and I let them down. This is the end of the line and the end of the world for me. I had failed. All my friends would move on, a year wasted. Maybe I would be forced to drop out. The failure would be on my CV and haunt me for life. A day later, my parents were shattered. Curiously enough, I was not. Sure, my ego and self-confidence had taken a whacking, but I was determined to get past the failure and learn from it. Isolated from my friends, I put everything I had into taking the classes again to prove a point to myself as well as to set the record straight. I passed all the subjects I needed to reappear for and was all the more proud for having done so. And those six months gave me time to think about what path I really wanted to take. 
One would think that after having suffered such a failure, my confidence and clarity would have ebbed. Instead, I felt more confident than ever before. I wanted to do something on my own. And from that point on, I learned to never take anything for granted. Ever. The reality check I got during those six months had given me my favorite motto. All glory is fleeting. When it was all over and I settled back into regular college, certain that the failure in my second year would never be repeated, my friends and I laughed about my misstep. In fact, one of the most enduring lessons I've learned about entrepreneurship and life in general is the value of laughter. To take an event we initially thought might devastate us, something awful, horrible, or disastrous, and redefine it for ourselves with a sense of fun, pride, or humor is to take the sting out of it, to put it in its proper perspective. I can't count the number of times over the last 25 years I've reminisced with one of my team members about a screwed up project, laughed and said, Oh, remember what happened? While at one point we may have felt that things would never be the same again, time and distance grants us perspective and smooth over a lot of those rough edges. So, often fears can be diffused by thinking, six months from now, we're all going to laugh about this. Summary It really does not matter what socioeconomic background you come from, if you are from a big city or a small town, or if you have family connections. As long as you have the hunger to succeed, innate confidence in yourself and in your abilities, the guts and conviction to take sensible risks, and a can-do attitude, you will prevail. There is no right age to become an entrepreneur, and no one except you can determine when you're ready. Entrepreneurship isn't for everyone. Even if you are a leader in a company and look to cross over, you need to make a frank assessment of your ability and your desire to succeed. I was bankrupt at 18, failed college the same year, and it could have been the end of my dream for me. I chose not to let that happen. Never start thinking what will happen if I fail. If you're half smart, you'll figure out how to survive. Never underestimate the power of humor. Laughter makes life's darkest events conquerable. Entrepreneurship in a nutshell. Action and reaction. Understanding, confronting and transcending fear. Working, disrupting and succeeding, trying and failing. And then laughing about it all later while absorbing lasting life lessons. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you enjoy listening to content on the IVM Podcast Network, let me tell you about a couple of things that you should check out this week. On Cyrus Says, journalist and news editor Maru Kinaya talks to Cyrus about the diminishing opposition in the parliament, her journey from growing up in Kashmir to studying at Harvard, her experience reporting 2611, and her podcast, The Note with Maru Kinayat. That's on the IBM Podcast Network. On The Seen and the Unseen, Amit Verma is joined by one of his most frequent guests, Vivek Kaul. They discuss the budget announced for the year 2019-2020 and answer listener questions in the second half. On the Habit Coach podcast, Ashton talks to one of the finest pastry chefs of India, Pooja Tingra, where they discuss various entrepreneurial habits. On Geek Fruit, Tejas and Jishnu are joined by stand-up comedian Rohan Joshi. They talk about the new Spider-Man movie, Far From Home. Thanks, and we hope to see you again soon. Hi, I'm Anupam Gupta, B50 on Twitter. And listen in to the Equity Sahiya podcast brought to you by Mozilla Loswell Asset Management Company. The Equity Sahiya podcast offers deep investment insights into the potential of many sectors in India which are growing and have a lot to offer for your portfolio. New episodes out every Tuesday on the IBM Podcast app or any other app where you get your podcasts from. <laughs>